theory of evolution and how it relates to human behavior. Okay, the field of sociobiology. Okay, looking for the biological basis of human social behavior. Okay, so these social behaviors exist because they confer an adaptive advantage. And so, in other words, you could also call this uh, evolutionary psychology. Okay. So, what kinds of behaviors might be something that we that may have given us an adaptive advantage that allow us to be more likely to survive as a species? Okay. The example they talk about in the textbook is evolution, and, and a lot of research on this. Now, evolution, like on the face of it, may seem like a strange example to use to illustrate um, how, you know, social, you know, certain kinds of behaviors can lead to an adaptive advantage because if you are altruistic, that means you're going to be helpful, that you're willing to sacrifice yourself in some way to help others. Well, if you are willing to sacrifice yourself, then on, that, does, that may seem unfortunate for you and your particular genes that you want to get passed on to the next generation. The whole point about being having an adaptive advantage is, is that you want to make sure that your genes get passed on to the next generation. Uh, the species will survive when, and your portion of the gene pool essentially survives when you can reproduce, when you can have children. So if you go pushing people out of the way of a train and getting hit by a train, well, your genes don't get passed on. Thus. There, is, there could indeed be a biological actual disadvantage for a person engaging in altruistic behavior. Okay. And there's, that was you know, one of the criticisms of the world. You know, in other words, criticizing evolutionary psychology, the idea that the social behaviors that we engage in, uh, many of the, you know, the ideas that they've evolved over time and that they allow us to survive. Well, someone might say, well, what about altruism? Altruism doesn't help you survive. Altruism, you get yourself killed. The answer is, well, you may get yourself killed, but in the process of helping others, you are going to ensure that other people survive and other people pass on their genes. And furthermore, you might be helping people who are similar to you. So maybe not your specific genes get passed on, but ones in the same gene pool actually do survive. And the research definitely shows that you are going to be more likely to be helpful, altruistic, to people who are uh, in the same or similar social, similar uh, kinship group to you. So family members, close friends, people who are similar to ourselves are the ones who we are most likely going to be willing to help, to perhaps even sacrifice ourselves to help them survive. And think about this for a moment. What would happen if nobody was altruistic? What would happen if nobody helped anybody else and everyone was looking out for numero uno? Would we survive as a species? Could we survive as a species if it was every man and woman for himself or herself? Can that possibly work? The answer is no. We need to be able to cooperate. Cooperation means sacrificing some of your time to help others. It's part of what we do. You need cooperation in order to do farming. You need cooperation in order to be able to find food and be able to um, be successful. And, and this, this is true throughout human history. We need cooperation to be able to even take this particular class, there needs to be some cooperation among different individuals. It's not just you and me. It is a whole group of people that are involved in allowing this course to be created and to be run. This is cooperation. Cooperation was necessary to create the laptop that I'm using right now to record this lecture. So again, cooperation is just a part of, uh, you know, the success of our species, and altruism may be a may be 
just as an aspect of cooperation, in other words, where you are helping someone, and that's part of what we do when we cooperate. According to uh, genetic similarity theory, it's kind of an extension of the concept of altruism. Again, we are, just like we are more likely to help people who are similar to us, we are also more attracted to strangers who genetically resemble us. Remember, the idea is we want to be able to pass on our genes to the next generation. Uh, so, we find someone who has some similarities to us that can further ensure that our genes get passed on to the next generation. Okay. And there seems to be some evidence to support this. In couples who are sexually active, they are they share more genetic markers than randomly selected couples. Couples with children share even more. Uh, and ma male friend pairs also share uh, more markers than random pairs. So it's indicating there's some kind of a genetic connection between people who have close relationships, particularly when those relationships involve having children. Okay. How is it possible? Maybe they have similar facial features, similar physical features, similar odors. There's actually research suggesting that. And of course cultural similarities, but again you think about cultural similarities are going to be, you know, you know, people are going to be living in the same in a similar culture, they're probably going to have some uh, some similarities. But again, the cultural similarities in terms of you know, your, maybe your, your race, race and ethnicity, and so on. Okay, now a big area of research when it comes to studying um, the effects of you know, theory of evolution when it comes to behavior, an area of interest often has to do with children, having children, finding mates and having children. Because essentially that's what it's all about. It's all about reproduction. If we don't reproduce, we don't survive as a species. If tomorrow everybody woke up and said, I'm not going to reproduce, no way, I'm not going to have any more children, nothing like that. Well, if nobody ever had children, then there'd be no next generation. So we uh, definitely, so that's definitely a big important factor in terms of the survival of our species. So there's a hell of a lot of research on the on studying sex differences between males and female sex differences in their approach to mate selection and their approach to uh, you know, having children. Okay. Let's start with uh, comparing females and males. Investment in the offspring. Females have a greater investment in the offspring than males do. Now maybe some of that has changed and that men are taking a more active role in raising children, but that is really a cultural uh, growth in our culture that essentially put, uh, allows that to happen. Basically from a physiological point of view, men are unable to breastfeed. Men are unable, men are not the ones who get pregnant. So females, by, you know, by definition, they need, you know, they need to carry, you know, the, the child through gestation, uh, nine months of pregnancy. Uh, and without formula, they would need to breastfeed for at least a year. And so that is a greater, that's a gr much greater investment in terms of how much they can, uh, they need to provide them, much, how much time and energy they need to spend on offspring. Males, you know, they are, they, they provide the sperm, but they don't breastfeed and they uh, are often, you know, if you think throughout history, they are providing, they are less invested in the raising of offspring. And there's plenty of evidence to support that throughout our history that's been the case. Okay. But nevertheless, that ha I believe that it is changing, and I think for the better. Uh, by necessity, physiologically, females can, females are only able to produce a limited number of offspring. I think maybe you have some, uh, you know, maybe the Duggar family or something can create uh, lots of all the 20 plus children or something like that. 
but uh, those are the rarities. So, basically, in her lifetime, a woman is very limited in terms of how many offspring she can produce, even if she wanted to. What about men? Men produce billions of sperm in their lifetime. Throughout their lives, even through old age, men can still generate offspring. There are, there are men who have fathered children well past the age of 70. Um, furthermore, men can uh, have sex with different women and have children with different women. So in other words, a man can essentially impregnate two women Within a week of when within a week of each other, and those two women can produce children, while for a, an, an individual woman can only produce you know one child at a time unless of course she has twins. Uh, so clearly, a man is able to generate a hell of a lot more offspring just because of physiological differences between males and females. Males do not carry the child. Males produce billions of sperm, so uh, they have uh, they can generate more offspring. The more offspring you generate, the greater the chance is that your genes will survive to the next generation. Okay? It's basically a numbers game. The man can produce, so in other words, the man by ma if the man wants to ensure that his genes get passed on, what he needs to do is maximize his sexual opportunities by essentially impregnating as many women as possible he can ensure that his genes get passed on. Now, I'm not recommending this strategy for men in terms of how they want to run their lives, but uh, from the evolutionary point of view, it makes a lot of sense. Females need to wait for the best male to come along. Now, why is that? Why can't a woman do the same thing and try to maximize her sexual opportunities? Well, uh, she kind of needs to be a little choosier because she would, uh, you know, there there needs to be some. Uh, she needs to be able to. Ha she needs to. Be, she's going to be in a period of vulnerability when she has when she is pregnant and when she has a job. She wants to be able to have a a, a partner who would be able to bond with her and be able to bond with the child be able to care for her and the child during her periods of vulnerability when she's pregnant and and when she is breastfeeding and so on. Uh, and again, because she can't go out and get impregnated all the time, she needs to perhaps, you know, she, need, she, she needs to be choosing because she has only a limited number of offspring she can produce. So she's investing a lot of energy and time into her offspring, so she would want to have a man who would do the same for her. Okay, So they're going to be choosier women and men are going to be a little bit less discriminating in the partners that they choose. Although men are going to certainly be interested in features that would signal um, greater likelihood of successful reproduction. So in other words, being young of reproductive age, physically healthy, uh, physically attractive. These are uh, signs that would be that the man would see as, you know, this is a woman who would be able to bear my children, essentially, and and that's essentially what men seem to be attracted to. Uh, you know, given everything, you know, all else is all else being equal, you know, men are seem to be, you know, more interested in physical attractiveness in terms of a potential partner than women are. Uh, again, this as culture changes, these preferences also may change. By the way, um, so what are men looking for? Men are looking for sex objects. Men are looking for women who would be able to show signs that they would be able to be, uh, you know, be be of you know be able to reproduce and you know show signs of successful. Uh, so, so show signs of physical health and attractiveness and so on. May, women, however, might be looking for males and considering them success objects. They might be seen as, you know, you know, wanting someone who has a good job, has money, has a sense, of, you know, would be able to provide security for her. And again, from the point of view, from the evolutionary perspective, 
this ensure this increases the likelihood that she'll be able to uh, successfully raise her offspring. Okay. So, if males are looking for females as sex objects, and males know that women are looking for men to be success objects, then males know that they would need to attract women with uh, signs that they would show that 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 they able that financial security, so wealth, power, and status, are things that men. Uh, display essentially to uh, attract women. On the other hand, women are looking to use uh, you know, signs of fertility, youth, fitness, and beauty in order to be able to attract men. Is there evidence to support this? There is plenty of evidence to support this. If you read personal ads that are advertised in the paper, the ones that are advertised by men are much more likely to be citing their wealth, power, and status, and women's ads for men are going to be citing their fertility, youth, and fitness, and beauty in order to be able to say this is, you know, why you should date me or why you should ask me out, that kind of thing. So this is, um, so there are going to be differences between male, so, but again, the idea from the evolutionary point of view is that these differences come from biological differences that males and females have, and these biological differences over generation after generation have, have resulted in set different kinds of strategies that males and females will use to ensure successful reproduction and ensure the survival of the species. And that these behaviors essentially have, um, have evolved over time. An interesting area of research um, coming from evolutionary psychology comes is, is in the study of jealousy. Okay. So, in other words, in, in this case, we're talking about jealousy, and where you know you have uh, a couple in a relationship, and what essentially would make if we're talking again, we're talking about a heterosexual couple here. What would we, if we're talking about male and female in relationship, what would be more likely to make the man jealous? What would be more likely to make the woman jealous, as far as from their partner's behavior? Okay. Uh, it starts basically from those concerns that males and females have based on evolutionary theory. Females are concerned about family support. Now, why are females concerned about family support? As I said before, females, they are, they are investing a lot of time and energy into, into uh, raising offspring. So they need to be able to have someone who would be there to be able to support her while she uh, goes through this period. And again, it's not just pregnancy and breastfeeding, it's also raising the child as the child grows. Uh, the females are more invested in that particular um, in, in that particular baby. In fact, if you, there are personality, there are, there are phys, you know, physiological characteristics, and we'll get to that when we get to the next chapter, which may be more relevant for females than males in terms of making them more, uh, essentially physiologically, more apt to be nurturing parents than males would be. Kind of the difference between oxytocin and testosterone. We'll talk about that again when we get to chapter 7. So, females need to have a partner who's going to stick around. They need to have a partner who's going to be able to provide resources for her and her, and her children. That allows her to get her genes passed on to the next generation. That's what it's all about. What about males? They're interested in paternity. Why are they interested in paternity? They want to make sure that the that their partner is um, carrying the child that they help produce, not some other guy's child. If if a man's wife is gives birth to a child of another man, then the man who is in the relationship, his genes don't get passed on. His gene, his line, his genetic line stops right there. Remember, for both males and females, the ultimate goal is to get your 
you know, to get your genes passed on to the next generation, to be able to move on to the next generation. That is what it's all about. Uh, so, and based on those physiological differences between males and females, this it leads to different concerns. So now, if those are the concerns that men and women have, men want to make sure that they're uh, that the wife that they have is producing a child that is his child and not somebody else's. So a man would be very, very upset if he found out that his wife or girlfriend was engaging in sexual infidelity. If she was having sex outside of the relationship, that would be threatening to his genetic line because she could be having sex with somebody else and she could then become pregnant with the other man's child. That is a big threat, so therefore, in a study that reveals, uh, in that way in which subjects were asked essentially, um, you know, how, you know, how upset would you be if you, if your part, if you found out that your partner was having a passionate sexual intercourse with somebody else, the man would be very, reported would be more upset over that. Um, for females, the story is a little bit different. For females, jealousy is resulting from, uh, you know, wanting, you know, that the man is forming an emotional bond with somebody else. Why is this important? Why is it essentially what we call emotional infidelity important to a woman? If a, if a woman's partner is showering affection and resources towards another woman, and perhaps another woman and her child, then the female is left out in the cold and her offspring is threatened. She needs to make sure that the partner is there to support her. Okay? And when asked, so this is a classic study done by David Buss, who was a preeminent evolutionary psychologist. I think he's at the University of Texas. He, um, his research asked people to make a choice. Would you be more upset if your partner was having a deep emotional attachment to another person? Or would you be more upset if your partner was having passionate sexual intercourse with, some, uh, with another person? Now, if what they, you know, again, so the idea being that the men w were found to be more jealous of sexual infidelity, the women reported more jealousy over emotional infidelity, kind of having an emotional relationship with somebody else. Interestingly enough, when I was in graduate school, I uh, used as my differ, uh, dissertation topic the topic of sexual and emotional infidelity and looking at the past research on it. I did a meta-analysis on this past research. Do you remember we talked? I don't know if we ever talked about a meta-analysis before, but a meta-analysis is where we would combine the results of many different studies. And by combining the results of many different studies, we were able, I was able to essentially kind of get a, uh, a good strong answer as to what the, the past researchers found on a particular type of question. So in this in my dissertation, I actually asked a number of different questions that all had to do with either sexual or emotional infidelity. And here's what I found. First thing I found was that men were more likely than women to engage in sexual infidelity. Most, I guess, people most would be would not be surprised by that. However, I will tell you that uh, as time goes on, those numbers might tend to even out in the future. Again, as more women get involved in the workforce, as more, uh, you know, you know, women, if you think about it, like a sexual freedom, decide, you know, going and engaging in sexual infidelity. So we'll have to see in the future. Uh, but interestingly enough, women were more likely than men to engage in emotional infidelity, forming that deep emotional attachment to somebody else. So women strayed from their partner, maybe not in terms of having sex, but in terms of 
finding a deep emotional attachment to somebody else. And women were more likely than men to engage in that kind of activity. Okay. Uh, one of the things I was also looking at were the reasons for why uh, men and women engage in infidelity. And kind of looking at sex differences in terms of the reasons that they would say that they would, or that they would endorse for engaging in infidelity. So yeah, I know infidelity is a bad thing, but if I were to engage in infidelity, uh, I would do it for this reason, that kind of thing. Okay. Men were more likely than women to approve of sexual dissatisfaction as a reason to engage in infidelity. So if a man is in a relationship with a partner who is, who for whatever reason, uh, he is not getting sexual satisfaction, enough sexual satisfaction from his partner, so maybe there's some sexual dysfunction or uh, or whatever it happens to be, or boredom or whatever it is. If the man is, is sexually dissatisfied, that men were more likely than women to approve of that as a as a reason to engage in infidelity. On the other hand, women were more likely than men to approve of relationship dissatisfaction as a reason to engage in infidelity. And this makes a lot of sense. You know, for women, it, the idea is that it's more about the emotional bonds. And if your emotional bonds are severed, then your relationship is going to suffer severely. You know, in a healthy relationship, there's a great deal of intimacy. So the women who are in an unhealthy uh, relationship, they are, they are, they are going to suffer relationship dissatisfaction. Not a, it's not necessarily about the sex, but it's about the... Uh, potentially about the emotional uh, bonds or the lack of them that may be in the relationship. And for women, we're more likely than men to improve of relationship dissatisfaction as a reason to engage in infidelity. So women saw that as a reason for straying from their partner and that they're, they're, it's not that they're not getting enough sex at home, maybe they're not getting enough love at home as a reason to engage in infidelity. Finally, let's talk about jealousy. Remember the studies about jealousy, about picking one or the other? Are you going to, uh, are you going, you know, are you, would you be more upset if your partner had, you know, if your partner was engaging in sexual infidelity, or you'd be more upset if your partner was engaging in emotional infidelity? You have sometimes, the, 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 the original study was done as like a forced choice, you know, because uh, sexual infidelity would be bothersome to both men and women. Uh, but the, 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 the point was that the woman or the man had to choose one or the other. Other studies have expanded on this thing, asking them basically, how upset would you be from sexual infidelity, from a partner's sexual infidelity? How upset would you be from a partner's emotional infidelity? Maybe not worded in those ways, but basically that's the idea, that the other ones are asking separate questions. So uh, in my research, I combined those studies to look at the, the book as the, those separate questions, you know, the, the, how upset they would be by emotional infidelity, how upset they'd be by sexual infidelity. Well, here's what I found. Consistent with Buss's original study, uh, men reported significantly being significantly more upset than women by a partner's sexual infidelity. And this is consistent with evolutionary theory, the idea being that his paternity presumably would, would be threatened by a partner's sexual infidelity. However, this gender difference, this difference between males and females, was relatively small. On the other hand, when it came to emotional infidelity, women were a lot more upset than men by a partner's emotional infidelity. In this case, there was a large gender difference. Women were a lot more upset over a partner's potential emotional infidelity than over a partner's uh, uh, than, 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 for, than, than, men were, than, than men were. So when it came to emotional infidelity, women were a lot more upset than men if their partner engaged in this kind of behavior. So an interesting thing to remember for the males and females in this course, to maybe something to understand about uh, your partner regarding how that goes. Okay. So again, to ex again, extending on ev on evolutionary theory in terms of strategies for gaining partners um, for females, the strategy would be to maximize attractiveness. Uh, and again, this is something that you know. Again, you look at personal. You know, so in other words, 
to be able to make sh make sure that the husband that the that the partner stays. You know, if the idea is that men are attracted to physically attractive women, then the woman to, will you maximize her own attractiveness to keep her partner there. Uh, men, if they want to keep the partner, maybe the pressure would be to kind of uh, spend as much money as you can, give in to her wishes, and uh, you know, try to essentially provide her as much support as he possibly could give. Interestingly enough, men are, might be more likely to use this if the wife is young or attractive. Why? Because this young or attractive wife may be more likely to stray. For females, maybe the maximizing attractive may be more likely to, have to be done if the husband has high income because, again, this man might decide to spend his resources elsewhere. So uh, that's at, the, at least the, from, the, from the evolutionary theory the point behind this. Okay. Also in support of evolutionary theory is the idea of the, the communication strategies. Females more inclusive, more sharing, more communal. Males more individualistic, dominance-oriented, problem-solving. And again, maybe, maybe reflect different kinds of uh, strategies for survival. So in other words, this, you know, but again, realize that the, these differences between men and women, evolutionary psychology is really only providing, is providing one, you know, point of view on this. There are other theoretical points of view that might explain these differences between men and women in different ways. Um, just another issue, young male syndrome is uh, an interesting uh, aspect about the way uh, that, 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 about what happens when males are, are you know, young males and they're teens and in their 20s, these are times in which there is a peak for when they might be engaging in violent crime, homicides. And the argument is that this may have evolutionary roots. The idea is that the young males who are of prime reproductive age, looking for partners, they you know may engage in risky behavior you know and essentially to make sure that they can attract mates uh, and be able to pro and pro produce offspring as soon as possible so this is like their peak when they're engaging in this behavior and again so like the there are there are many other animal species that have like these ritualistic conflicts and stuff like that you know goats butting horns with each other but they're very kind of like a ritual that takes place you know where the dominant person takes over for the uh, to the to the le to the to the uh, submissive person to the submissive uh, you know animal submissive male. So in other words, this essentially means that the strongest male is going to be in charge of the whole group. So there are different animal species that have similar types of things. Maybe in uh, in our culture, you know, maybe we've lost those rituals, or maybe the rituals have come with guns and knives in which we now, instead of just posturing, maybe now commit homicides actually, kill people. And that's obviously a problem. It's not going to be good for our survival, is it? Uh, so anyway, if a purse, if a man is single, unemployed, and low status, and essentially they have poor mating potential, this is where they're going to try to enhance their dominance as much as possible, at least according to this point of view. The idea being that they will try to compensate for their lack of status financially to having greater status in terms of strength. And that's where they would focus on. And again, males are more likely than women to commit murder, particularly during those peak times between ages of like, you know, between the teenage years and the, uh, and the 20s. If you look at uh, page 130 in the textbook, figure 6.4, looking at the homicide rates in Chicago between 1965 and 81, you can see that huge jump in terms of the number of homicides for the age groups between, you know, between the teenage years and, um, you know, the 20s and 30s. And then it kind of levels off afterwards. For females, it's pretty much a similar low rate no matter what the age. So something does seem to be going on with men. 
as we get to the next chapter, maybe we'll talk about testosterone as being a potential explanation for what might be going on. Now with assessment, um, we don't really know enough about what is going on with um, our genes in terms of how it really has impacts on personality. I mean, we have some some evidence, a little bits of evidence here and there, but it's kind of uh, not put, not really all together yet. Uh, we don't really know all, enough about our genes to be able to, um, you know, assess people essentially. They say, okay, you're this type of personality or that type of personality just by looking at someone's genes. Then again, are there ethical implications for essentially um, you know, analyzing personality by analyzing someone's genetics. Maybe it's, there's a, maybe we're opening a, a Pandora's box in this way in which, you know, maybe people would uh, be wanting to select uh, both physical and personality characteristics in their ideal offspring, which again makes uh, some uh, ethical concerns for sure. It is clear that there are some disorders, psychiatric disorders, that undoubtedly have a genetic basis to it. Schizophrenia, for example, that's a very strong concordance rate for identical twins, 50%. That's big. Uh, for, for fraternal twins, it's only about 9%. That's still pretty big, but... Uh, but, but Schizophrenia in twins surely it essentially suggests a strong genetic component to this disorder. Uh, there also seems to be a genetic um, basis for bipolar disorder. There's been research in the Amish community, for example, linking to specific chromosomes. Again, we'll have to learn more in the future regarding the actual genes and chromosomes that are involved, but that comes, uh, comes later. So, alcohol abuse, there's been a link to um, alcohol abuse, the genetic link with that. Uh, and it may have to do with dopamine, as we'll talk about in the next chapter. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is very much involved in pushing us towards activities, towards doing things. It's an approach neurotransmitter. And maybe people are... In Approaching the rewarding benefit, the, the the immediate rewards of alcohol, without thinking about the negative consequences of it. Uh, finally, antisocial uh, behavior. There seems to be also a higher concordance among uh, identical twins uh, when it comes to uh, childhood behavior problems and also adult crimes. So there is something to this here. Okay, realize again, we've been focusing a little bit on more on the evolutionary, but there's also cultural evolution that takes place as well. Uh, as, you know, we have in our culture, you know, we have fads, we have changes that come about that lead to, maybe lead to very fast changes. If you think about the changes in technology in recent years, uh, have really changed the way we interact with each other as, as uh, in, the, in our social groups. So that's a cultural evolutionary change. Biological evolution takes place over generations and generations, much slower. So maybe, maybe, just maybe, cultural evolution may have a bigger influence just because it's so much faster and so much so proximal to how we, you know, to where we are at the time. Um, unfortunately, however, you know, there might be situations where biological evolution and cultural evolution and the cultural environment may, may conflict. Uh, and I think that there may be the case, for example, in terms of the differences between males and females when it comes to uh, raising children, in that, uh, you know, perhaps in a culture where, you know, you're expected to just work, 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 and leaving no time for family as the sign of success, well, then that is leaving women essentially out of the picture. That kind of uh, 
that kind of pushing. And if a woman wants to raise a family and be successful, our culture needs to kind of adjust to that. And perhaps we have to some degree, but not nearly enough. All right, so next time what we're going to talk about, next time we're going to get to Chapter 7 and talk about what is going on internally, what, is going, what biological processes are going on that actually relate to personality.